Welcome to the Be Unstoppable In The Zone podcast. My name's Lisa Clifford and I'm your host. Be Unstoppable for me is all about helping you unlock your incredible human potential and for you to access your mind in a way that it works for you. And that's why I became an empowerment and firewalking instructor, running events where people participate in a way that reveals to them who they truly are without a shadow of a doubt and therefore enabling people, you, to live the life that you want without any limitation. Each episode in this series has guests that I'm interviewing that have valuable gems and nuggets and perspectives that have served them in their life and also lessons that they've learned and I just thought it'd be great to get under the bonnet so to speak in the zone and uh, listen to their journey and stories and I hope in some way that you connect to some part, if not all. So I hope you enjoy this next episode. Welcome, my old, old friend, David Taylor. Now, not old in age. I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> old in time served, I would say. Um, for those that don't know David, David is the CEO and president of... Adriatic Luxury Hotel Group. Have I said that right? Adriatic? Da, da, super. Oh, there we are. We're getting a bit of Croatian there, I think. Um, uh, so, David, when did you land in Croatia and start a new life? How long ago was that? Uh, I guess the landing in Croatia bit happened in the end of May 2019. And that was for a meeting with the the owners of the company I'm working with today, Yadranski Luxusni Hoteli, or Adriatic Luxury Hotels. Um, that was the very first time I'd ever visited Croatia. And I was really impressed with what I saw and experienced. And I then took up the role in September, September the 1st. So actually four years ago in one week's time. And... And it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride since then, but it's been the most amazing experience. Well, I think we should take people back to why I think it, it's newsworthy and uh, listener proof for the Be Unstoppable in the Zone podcast. When we go back to you started in hotels in London, 1990 originally. 33 years ago, <laughs> 33 years ago, none of us are old enough to be saying anything was 33 years ago. And, um, and that's where you started your hospitality journey. And then we met oh, 23 years ago. I think I was mm-hmm. 30. Yeah, just... we met in the year 2000. Did, we did, because I remember you interviewing me. I was uh, in, not in a cast, but I'd previously... Uh, broken my leg, falling off a table at a senior manager's conference, dancing. And um, you and I already had a phone call lined up. But I didn't know you'd fallen off a table and broken. <laughs> no, that was, that was pre my disgrace. <laughs> We'd agreed to meet up. I was at Chorus and Regal Hotels. You were a new sales director at Paramount Hotels. And we were referred to each other and we were about to meet up. But the shame of ringing you from my hospital bed, having disgraced myself. I mean, in hospitality, we've got to say, we do know how to have a good time, don't we? We, we can stay up all night and be the first up in the morning and be well, right as a body. This is the people business. And I think we know how to do that really well. <laughs> yes. And so when I take myself back to then when... Uh, and and to be fair, just to give a bit bit of backstory, our chairman would get us on the tables dancing, not at Paramount. Our chairman would get us on the tables dancing. So I was just honouring his um, protocol, really. But sadly, this table wasn't secure. Anyway, I had to ring you, David, from my hospital bed to say I can't make my interview. <laughs> 
because I've broken my leg. And you came when I was released from hospital, you came and visited me at my friend's farmhouse my two golden retrievers at the time and we sat around the kitchen table I thought I'd make up with it on we're doing my CV on sterling beautiful paper and that's where our journey of uniqueness began I mean you did leave yeah. looking like but, the I, but I don't know how you got the job <laughs> because I, I, walked, I walked into that farmhouse wearing a new suit <laughs> and I left having met your two golden retrievers and I looked like a sheep <laughs> To the same so well. I remember. I love meeting. dogs, and I think they knew it. And before I knew where I was, I was covered in golden retriever. <laughs> oh, it took me two that, weeks to get it off. <laughs> that has to be the interview that goes down in history for me. And I don't know how I got the job. I do remember starting working, and we went into that petrol strike crisis. So I started my new job with you. Um, with the petrol strike on. And I remember um, the hotels, the hotel managers thinking that I was disabled. <laughs> and then the next time that they see me, I haven't got my walking crutch and I think it's been a miracle. <laughs> oh, so we go right back to, to then. So your journey from Paramount Hotels in 2000, 2000 mm -hmm. then took you where? Um well, with Paramount for a few years, and then Paramount was sold in 2003, and myself and the other two directors, we set up Q Hotels as a, as a new company. Um, and then I left Q Hotels, and I have to think back now to make sure I get the years right, in 2011. And from there, I went to do some consultancy work with IHG that ended up being a, a long period of time in my life where I, I did a, a couple of jobs for them, but culminating as VP commercial for UK and Ireland. And at that stage, the owners of those hotels, which was a collection of holiday inns, Crown plazas, um, they sold the hotels over a 12 month period, which was, was part of the team that went through the process of doing that. Mm -hmm. And from there went to work with GLH hotels in London, again, initially as a consultant, but they then retained me on a full time basis and stayed there between January, 2015 through to September, 2019 or the end of August, 2019. Um, in, in the same role, really, as Chief Commercial Officer. And um, th those changes were really, really good for me. I think I learned a lot moving from a different type of company to a different type of company. So Paramount, as you know, was a national chain of 16 hotels. Q Hotels was a completely new startup with private equity backing. IHG was a global brand, you know, and... The portfolio of hotels at the time I was working for was 65 hotels of all managed hotels, but with different owners. And then going into GLH, which was Singaporean owned, um, wholly owned, privately owned by a, a family. And, and then coming over to ALH, which is also um, owned by a family, ultimately in, in Chile. So lots of different types of ownership schemes and different ways of working and different methodologies and it's been really interesting for me and I've, I've always felt as though I've been learning a lot going through that journey and you know many people make the same same journeys and they they, they take something new from every role um, but I have to say David maybe you've got a filter on <laughs> but you <laughs> don't, you have not aged you have not <laughs> aged. Hospitality has not broken you. It's not. It's not made you jaded. It suited you. And um, and Paramount. I think well, something's gone somewhere. But <laughs> yeah, there there is there is. Some, well, I never saw the top of your head anyway. Being you know, <laughs> five foot one and you're six foot one, two, two, six foot two. Yeah. So I'd. I'd I don't miss the top of your head. Never saw it. But um, but uh, Paramount was backed by venture capitalists. So mm -hmm. that was when you were there. 
that was a real baptism by fire because they're not easy to work for, are they? Yeah, I mean, I think you've had a good there from Hilton as well, which, as you know, is a very structured, um, precise, defined way of working. And we got to Paramount and it was very fluid. Things were still, you know, in startup mode in many ways. And, you know, the business needed clear strategy, direction, organization, ways of working and but, but it, it, it's it's great fun doing things like that because you have a level of freedom you don't always get in other organizations and you're allowed to bring in your your thinking and your personality and um you know in many ways I look back on Paramount as being a brilliant education because there wasn't really a lot there when we first got there and it was a company that was struggling to generate turnover but could do profit quite well mainly through cost management so we were brilliant at managing costs but the secret there was to improve revenue and I think you know I, I look back and my two partners and the private equity company gave us a lot of backing and a lot of trust and you know we brought in new people and built a, a commercial structure and a team there and it really accelerated the performance of that company and that stood us in good stead when we then got into Q Hotels and did something similar, but I think better because we'd learned a lot of lessons beforehand. And I've tried to take that same thinking from each position to the next. Let's do, do it better, do it in a way that we can outperform it again. And, you know, going back to what you've said, you know, hospitality, I think, has been very, very kind to me and... I think it's an amazing, an amazing career. And, you know, a lot of people look at it and think, yeah, it's extremely hard work. Maybe it's not. But at the same time, you meet some of the most fantastic people who are so dedicated and they have such a, a way of working with people. And it's it's really heartwarming, I think. And, and that's what keeps us all fresh, motivated. Every day is different. You know, every challenge is a different one. And that, that without a doubt, keeps me excited about what we do and, and why we do it and how we do it. And I think if you can ever find a job that you love, then it never seems like a job. Mm. Oh, do you know what I love about hospitality? I fell into it, sort of fell into it. Mm. My older stepsister was a waitress at the Royal York and I thought she looked like she'd got this amazing job so I went to waitress there what I love about hospitality is you can go in at any level and choose where you want to be whether you want to work in accounts or not that not that hospitality engineers it for you but if you've got the appetite the uh, commitment and the willingness to learn you can you can carve out any path in hospitality if you work hard and get where you want to be you can you can climb the ladder in it and I don't think I can't think of an industry that that can provide those opportunities can you not not easily and I think one of the things that makes it so special is that you can employ people for attitude here as well as capability. And that attitude will carry people a very, very long way. And if they don't have the right attitude, you can see it very quickly. And then this is not the career. And it can, ca it can carry them a long way out the door. Yeah, it can. <laughs> it can. Because ultimately, you know, we're dealing with guests and guests can be very demanding or not so demanding, but ultimately they're all people with feelings and they want to have a good time and a great experience. And at the same time, you're also working with colleagues and employees who also want to get something out of the job that they're doing. You know, they're not just automatons turning up day in, day out, just hoping that it's always going to be the same. And they interact a lot with guests. And, you know, I've got so many stories over the years where guests have had fantastic relationships with members of the team and invited them on holiday to places like America and Australia and so on, because they, they got on so well. And those guests come back year after year and they see those people as being extended members of their family. And it's not because, you know, those employees 
were amazingly well qualified or whatever. They just had a brilliant aptitude for working with guests and members of the public and it's recognized. Um, there's something really heartwarming about hospitality at times, I think, where you can make a really good human connection with people out of nothing. Mm. And those connections can last you for a lifetime. And yeah, you know, we're, we're good examples of that, I think, where yeah. we were connected through hospitality. And I've got so many former colleagues and peers over the years who to this day I'm still very good friends with. And I think this industry is very good at doing that. I want to talk to you about Croatia, but before then, I want to ask what role, when you first started working in hospitality, what role did you start at? Um, I, my first job was as a conference sales executive for the London Metropole Hotel back in 1990, at a time when that hotel only had 500 bedrooms and it was a tower block, a 1970s tower block. And they were building a new um, extension to the building, a little bit cubic in design, which is right on Edgware Road. And that was an extra 150 bedrooms and massive conference facilities. Um, remember the original Monarch Suite could take up to 1200 guests for conferences and it was something they'd never had. And I met them at the time, was selling advertising for a, a publishing company in London and went for the meeting out of chance more than anything else. And I remember very, very vividly the sales director said, what makes you think you can come and join here as a salesperson? And I said, look, I'm in a world where I'm, I'm selling something that isn't published for the next few weeks or months. And here you have a product that people can see, touch, smell, taste, interact with. How hard can that be? Um, and he bought it and I joined. And it was only then that I realized exactly how hard it can be. And I really struggled for the first six months because I couldn't quite understand the difference that relationships made in that type of role. You know, I'd previously been selling space in a book and it's quite transactional. But when you're selling an experience in a product like that and you're going to see conference organizers who are basically putting their career in your hands when you're telling them you can deliver the most amazing conference for them. Can you? Are you sure? Because if they don't get it right, if the hotel does not deliver it, then that organizer has to explain themselves to their bosses and that can be very difficult if it's been a bad experience. So you, you have to understand that whatever you're then discussing and agreeing with a customer, you've got to deliver it. And to deliver it, you have to have really great relationships with your peers who are in operations in the hotels. And you, know, you have to be sure that they've got a very clear understanding of what the guest or organizer wants and expects to achieve and that they can deliver it. And if you can't communicate that, it doesn't happen. And the booker is unhappy and they never use you again. And you have a fairly short career. So, you know, in many ways, you've got to be able to join the dots between understanding the, the guest or the organizer and then relaying that to the operation of the hotel to be sure that they can execute it to precisely what the customer is expecting that's that's the hard part and it, i have to be honest with you it took me at least six months to to get to grips with that but once i figured it out then it came quite naturally and ultimately i think you know communication is so important in so many ways between what the buyer is looking for and what the seller is delivering. And there are so many deals that go wrong where there's a gap between what the expectation is and what the reality is, simply because it hasn't been communicated properly. Mm, mm. Everything boils down to communication, doesn't it? I, yeah. just, want, I just want to say, <clears throat> you are, well, my my business name is Be Unstoppable and this is a podcast of being in the zone. 
But if there ever was an example of somebody who has been unstoppable in their career and inspirational, David, it's you. You start off as a cheeky, I imagine you were cheeky from the Northeast. It's part of the DNA. A cheeky sales exec in central London to be in the CEO in president and president of a luxury hotel brand in the most... Not always so kind. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be sending a note for 50 quid, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> in a luxury hotel group in a most beautiful country. If that isn't an example of somebody who, and you know what? I have never seen you. I was thinking just as you were talking, you're always calm. And I'm thinking, Lisa, you must have, you must have made him mad yourself at some point. Have I ever seen you flap, panic? You've always, no matter, no matter how hungover, no matter how excited, you've always been level-headed. Or the appearance of it, I've seen you. I've seen you go pink a couple of times, but I'm pretty sure that was the sun and a and a, and a particularly competitive team building day. But <laughs> you've always been calm, a little bit like um, slow and steady wins the race. But I would never say you were slow. So. What has uh, hospitality given you that you will be forever grateful for? Um, that's a really difficult question. I wish you'd asked me that a week ago so I could have thought about the answer properly. I tell you what, we can park it and see if it comes oh, back, come back around. Again. Well, see if it, if it starts to come out because the mind does that. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult question because I'm sure... There's, who you are today is because of the opportunity hospitality gave you to express your personality, push yourself, test yourself, stand up for yourself, um, enjoy okay. yourself. I think the, the obvious answer is going to be things like a standard of living and a way of life and success <laughs> and so on. But it, it's not the right answer. Um, you know, the more I think about it, the, the right answer is that I have met some really brilliant people over the years and I've learned so much from them in so many ways. And that's what makes me who I am today. It's not, it's not down to me. It's, it's down to a lot of other people and things that I've seen in them and things that I've, I've really wanted to aspire to are different facets of all of them. But in many ways, they, they make us who we are to this day. And that's the thing I'm, I'm always grateful to. You know, I, I remember one of the best bosses I ever had worked for a book publishing company in central London because he was uber calm about everything. Nothing was ever a drama. We could have a publishing deadline in an hour and we could need a piece of print or a piece of copy or an ad in an hour. And, and he would say, and I remember him vividly to this day, Jerry, Jerry Odlin, and he would say, don't worry, we'll get it, we'll do it. This is what we need to do. And then we would all go away and do it. And sure enough, it would be solved. And that, that was a great lesson at its time. You know, just this clarity of thought, no matter what the circumstances. And, you know, Jerry was great. And I learned a lot from him. But there have been so many others along the way. Too many to list or name. But, you know, when I look back on those people that I've met and learned from and spent time with... I think one of the qualities that always comes out is that, you know, they, they're generally very level-headed people. They're pretty calm. They're pretty insightful. They're always thinking left and right about other options. They never just take the blindingly bleeding obvious. And over, over time, that's just been something that stuck with me. And, you know, I remember when I was quite young in my career, I met someone who went on to become very, very well known in the industry, um, a guy called Stuart Metcalf at Hilton at the time. And Stuart had never met me before and, and they just bought um, Stackis, who I was part of then. And he sat me down and said, look, David, this is, this is pretty simple to me. Um, we have certain expectations in terms of what we want you to achieve in the business. I'll never lose my temper with you. I'll just look you in the eye calmly and tell you whether I think you're performing well or you're not performing well. And then I'll tell you why. And I, I look back on that and think, what a great way to manage people. No drama, no histrionics, 
clear communication, this is working or this is not. And then you can do something with it or not. It's your choice. And, you know, I, I went to work back with Stuart in my IHG days because he was then on the owner's side. And I loved working with him again. And we got on so well. And I think, you know, I look to people like that. And there are many others where they just have a, a, a clarity of thinking and they can cut through the drama of a crisis very, very easily. So, you know, I'm, I'm in Croatia and COVID is breaking out and all sorts of stuff going through your head. And you automatically go back to some of the, the best thinking that you've experienced in your career from those, those role models, those people who were able to get through other dramas like petrol strike you mentioned, foot and mouth, you know, 9-11, financial crashes. I had the joy and the privilege of working with so many people who could think through those problems very clearly so that when I'm then in a position like this and it's happening, I instinctively know what to do, but I also instinctively know how to behave. Mm. Other people expect you to behave. They don't want to see somebody panicking and having a meltdown. And so they look to you for leadership and good judgment and common sense. And I think that that's probably what hospitality has really given me that I'll be forever grateful for. I've had this brilliant opportunity to learn from so many good people that I'm not sure I'd have been able to get that chance anywhere else. Mm. And it also sounds to me like the bosses you've had have an air of absolute belief. You know, when you were saying about the copy and one deadline and one hour deadline. And when somebody speaks with that degree of belief, you behave as though it's true, don't you? And, yeah. and just to talk about belief for a moment, um, it is my, it is very close to my heart. I know that I did some work with a few of your sales teams actually over the few, over the few, you let me loose with them. That was amazing. Um, I think self-belief in businesses can be seen as something that people work on as a last resort. But I remember a conversation that we had where you said, Lisa, the guys are hit gonna coming up against a really steep target. They're about to go into renegotiation. They're people, people, and I want them to hold their nerve in those meetings and go for the rate growth that we know that our clients have the capacity to take and that my team believe in themselves that they can go for it. And in that training, you attended every single one of the trainings. You were fresh as a daisy. You led from the front and there was nothing that you didn't expect of them that you weren't willing to do yourself. But all that whole session was only about self-belief and, and learning a mindset that puts each person in their success model. And um, so just from that, how valuable is self-belief to somebody's performance? Black and white answer, which I know I'll get because that's how you are, but black and white answer because I think businesses need their teams to have the belief in alignment with their skill set. What's your view? Um, I think there are many times in your career where you're in difficult positions and you've got or difficult decisions to make, or you just don't think that things are going your way. And unless you have a level of self-belief that you can rely on and trust, I think life is pretty, pretty tough. And that self-belief, I, I don't know how you get it and I don't know how it builds itself up, but sometimes you just feel it intuitively and you have to let it loose. You have to trust it. And there are so many times where the logical part of my brain will think, yes, but is that right? And can that work? And does it add up? And sometimes you just have to let it loose. And that's when I think self-belief can really carry you through those really tough times and those dark places and, and get you through the other side. And you might not know what the other side looks like, 
but you made it. And that's the important thing. You made it and you live to fight another day and you, then you can build towards the next victory and you can start to stretch to the next target. And, and without that, I think it's really impossible. It's so easy to give up so many times. And, you know, people do give up. And it can be such, such a tragedy in many ways because I've known circumstances where people have left or they've just not gone on to do what you would have hoped they could have done. And then shortly after they leave, the opportunity of a lifetime turns up for them and you just wish that they'd stayed and they wish that they'd stayed and so on. But, you know, life, life gives people different choices and options and you, you take what's ahead of you. But without that inner self-belief, I sometimes think it would be so much more difficult. And I, I I don't know. I think experience is a great teacher as well. And and that helps consolidate that self-belief within you. And you know, over time it gets stronger because you get used to making good decisions and you get used to certain scenarios that when you were younger you never felt that you could deal with. Mm. But experience gives you the confidence and the knowledge to know that you can deal with it and you can come out the other side stronger and better and more efficient and faster. And when you begin to understand that, that's when your self-belief gets even stronger. And it gets to a point where you do genuinely feel as though you're unstoppable. You can you can just plow through whatever the issue is and you know you're going to make it. And with that level of experience and knowledge and clear thinking and the ability sometimes to step back and take another look that I think helps your self-belief so much that sometimes when you're younger I sometimes think now when I look back when I was younger I was just in a hurry all the time and wanted to get on and do well and never really thought that much about self-belief really or or what it meant but I think as you get more experienced and a bit and a bit wiser you begin to understand that all of those things that are ahead of you they're just adding to the story you know it's just it's another thing in front of you that you will find a way to get past if you believe you can if you believe you can't then don't try it well you won't be able to and and yeah. linking nicely uh, i mean i think self-belief is backing yourself and backing yourself must have been exactly what you needed to do to leave the country you'd only ever lived in uh sort of leave your wife physically leave your wife but not leave your wife and your two boys to create a life for everybody in another in another country to create a life for everybody whilst you were in another country that speaks a different language to you with a new hotel chain. No, no mates over there already that makes it an easy landing. You must have had self-belief to take that step because that's a massive step. And not only that, but to run a hotel group. So what was that transition like for you? I think it, it didn't work out the way that it was planned first of all, because obviously COVID got in the way. Six months later. You know, I, I was living in Yorkshire and traveling to London every week, and it's actually easier to get to Dubrovnik. It takes two hours, 50 minutes on a plane from Leeds Bradford. So initially, logistics of it were pretty simple. I know you say I had two boys and so on, but I should stress they're 25 and 21 now. And Are they? How did that yeah, happen? At the time this decision was made, you know, my eldest was in university, my youngest was going through A-levels a and stuff. So it felt like the right time in my life where they were growing up and moving on. And I, I'd always really wanted to do something different because I, I felt I'd been in the UK a long time and had covered a lot of a lot of positions and had grown naturally. But I love change and I like doing new things and learning new things and I've got to be honest with you I took a call from a headhunter saying we'd like to put you forward for a role in Croatia what do you think and I went no no chance forget it it's not me and I don't know why I said that I just did and after three calls I then decided to go and meet the owner and then came away from that thinking do you know what this is a really serious business 
it's going places, it's very high quality, they're very um, clear in their thinking in terms of what they want for the business and so on. And it, it really did give me food for thought. But even then, I still didn't expect it to happen, you know. Well, I remember talking to you, David, and I remember you having gone over, feeling like, God, if I get this, all my Christm- Christmases, Christmases have come at once. This is an unbelievable opportunity with the most amazing chain and people. It's a, it's yeah, but you, you never really expect these things to happen. You know, I think I just mm-hmm. thought, you know, there'll be a lot of other people in Europe and so on or in Croatia who are perfect for this role and so on. And for whatever reason, you know, they chose me and I'm grateful that they did. And, I, you know, I constantly want to prove to them that it was a, a good decision. And um, so far, so good. <laughs> but, you know, I, I kind of look back then and it, it, it was it was a decision that I think just felt so natural. And sometimes these things do. I never really got that stressed about it. Obviously, I was stressed about talking to my wife, saying I'm going to be working overseas and how do we manage the logistics? And the plan originally was we'll travel back and forwards. It's no problem. And it wasn't for the first few months. It really wasn't a problem at all. It was just like being in London again, you know, where I was away most of the week and back at weekends. I had family or friends coming out on weekends or I'd be going back at weekends but then in February March of 2020 Covid happened and then suddenly there was no travel and I think in 2020 I saw Catherine after I came to Croatia in January 2020 right up until Christmas of 2020 we saw each other for five days and that wasn't in the plan. No. You know, I saw my kids for five days. That wasn't in the plan. And that was only when they came across. And then the rules changed and quarantine was happening and they had to fly straight back. Um, so I, I I kind of felt that look, we're faced with circumstances that we've we've got to kind of get through. And you know, obviously I had a job to do here, and that was all about making the right decisions for the company and protecting our employees and making sure that the business was in good shape. And that took a lot of my time. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, the Zoom that we're now on was brilliant at the time because we were doing family quizzes at weekends and so on. And and everybody was so supportive of me and what I was going through and so on. And and it just it felt okay. It was it it was tough, but it it was bearable. And I think what it allowed me to do as well at the same time was to work with the team here very closely to understand that, look, these circumstances are not ideal. How do we make the best of it? So at some point we think it will end. When it ends, how do we become really good at what we do? And how do we become the best that we can be and what what do we need to do now to prepare for that because I I didn't want to come out of a crisis and just walk at normal pace and not and not not take the crisis as an opportunity correct yeah yeah correct so in in many ways it was it was pretty strange but you're right you know I I landed on August the 31st um at about four o'clock in the afternoon and got connected and basically picked up a key for a, an apartment and a car key and then went to Lidl and because <laughs> the fridge was empty and spectacularly dropped a bottle of red wine at the checkout <laughs> which exploded and went everywhere and fortunately somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said don't worry I'll help because everybody spoke Croatian and I didn't know a word. Um, And it turned out that Maria works in our finance office and I was very grateful that she'd recognised the guy who was about to start work the next day and helped me out. But from that point on, the the next morning, I came to the office and didn't know anybody. Um, But actually really relished that as as a great way to, I think, stretch myself and learn more about what I was capable of and 
and also I think to find out more about hospitality and hospitality industry and how it works internationally and to understand different markets different ways of working different employee mindsets and so on and it, it's really quite liberating when you go somewhere and you don't know anybody yeah anybody. you can be completely who you want to be and you know I would go out of the weekend wearing a t-shirt and shorts and there were people who knew me because I was their boss, but I had no idea who they were. <laughs> and that, that's quite liberating. You know, in many ways, you can start from a completely clean page and say, this is what I want us to achieve in this business. And there's no baggage, none whatsoever. And the team either trust you or they don't. So you've got to work quite hard in the beginning to get everybody on board to, you know, to help them, I think, understand that they're not working for an idiot and to be pretty sure about what you know and what you do and to be clear about how you want the business to develop and to, to trust them as well. You know, I was very conscious. I didn't want to arrive in Croatia and keep saying, ah, but in London, we did this. It's just mm -hmm. it's not right. Mm -hmm. In London, we learned certain things and certain ways doesn't make it right it mm. makes it right for that situation mm. this situation it's something completely different so i was very keen in the early days to do a lot of listening and to ask a lot of questions and i think at times they got a bit sick of me asking questions but it was it was good because we could build a relationship up and i spent quality time with you know the key people here who who really helped me understand not just how the business was operating, but about the culture of the business and how the business had changed and, and what they felt the business needed in the future. And you don't always get the time to be able to do that. And COVID, I think, gave us some time to be able to do that. And then when you begin to understand all of that, then the pieces begin to come together like a big jigsaw much faster. And, you know, Listening is a skill, for sure. Try listening when it's a foreign language. And the, the English is excellent here. I have to say that the, the standard of English is amazing. But I've always wanted to make a point of learning Croatian because I think it's important. And it is unbelievably difficult at times, but I've persevered and kept going, and slowly but surely, getting better. But it, it, it's not easy. And... You know, I, I was laughing with my ops director the other day because he said, when you very first came and we all had lunch together for the first time, we all thought we spoke English quite well. And then we heard you speak and we couldn't ah. understand a word of what you were saying. Oh. <laughs> and I, I said to him, I wish you'd told me that at the time. Because I, I, as you know, I'm from Newcastle and I've got a slight Geordie accent, but I hadn't appreciated that just by talking at my normal speed, you wouldn't get it. And I've, I've really slowed down my rate of speaking. And I, quite dramatically, when I think back to the way I used to speak, it was way quicker than it is now. But that's because I'm conscious that I'm speaking to most people and English is their second or their third language. And finding that common ground takes a little bit of time, but it's, you know, it's just one of many lessons that you learn. And and that's one of the things that I'm, I'm very grateful for. You know, I've started in, in a new job, in a new country, in a different position. And um, asking all of those questions and piecing it together is just another dimension to some of the skills that I've had before in the past. And it changes the way you behave and it changes the way you think for the better. Not, not for the worse, for the better. And it, it makes you realize that people are, they're very similar no matter where you are in the world. You know, ultimately people come here to do the right thing and to do, you know, to have a great day and to do, to do the job well. That's the same in Berlin or Tokyo or London or wherever. It's then beginning to understand, okay, well, how can I now get this team to work the way that I think they need to work to be able to do it all much better. And that that's a little bit complicated because 
culturally that's a bit of a a bit of a challenge but it's not impossible by any means it's really interesting because since i got here quite a few um peers and former colleagues in the uk who have been interested in working overseas but have never had the the courage or the opportunity to do so have called me or asked me you know could you give me some advice could you help me understand what do i need to be aware of what what should i look out for what are the opportunities what are the pitfalls and it's great to be able to give that because for many people it's it's really exciting but very daunting but it it's a wonderful thing to do and it it helps you grow as a person and I'm really very glad I did it and you know I, I would like to say that I think I'm putting a lot back into the industry here by helping the team in Croatia and Dubrovnik, they're also learning new things from me and new learnings from some of the things that we've done elsewhere in, in the UK or in Europe. And it's a symbiotic relationship. Everybody benefits from this. And um, I've just got a couple more questions before I release you back to your team. What's been the deepest learning curve of your career? Oof. Um, oh, that's a hard question, a, a very hard question. Um, I think if I look, if I look back, um, it's probably a couple of things. The first is how you manage a crisis. Because, you know, we, we've been around a long time and we've had a lot of crisis, mm. recessions. I've forgotten how many we've dealt with now. Um, economic issues, um, major terrorism incidents, um, pandemics, foot and mouth, petrol strikes, you name it, we've, we've had them all. And when you go into those situations, it's... It's really important that you can see the other side of what that issue is and you can prepare to come out of that situation in a stronger position than you are when you're in it, but also to know that you will get through it. Um, they throw different sets of challenges at you and it's your ability to be able to deal with that and learn from them and question at the same time you know did we make the right decision there could we have done that better they are without a doubt immensely challenging periods of anybody's career and they're huge challenges and you learn a lot from doing them but I think at the same time changing roles is also huge challenge you know you when you change companies when you change jobs when you change positions in whatever industry, whoever that person is, I think that is a real personal challenge and a test of your own belief. And there's always this, can I make that change? Can I, can I move from company A to company B? Can I go from this job to that job? What will that be like? And that, that, that can be quite daunting. And, and that is also a big challenge because you have to read the room pretty quickly wherever you're going to and you have to understand the the issues and and the opportunities there pretty quickly and those moments can make or break people quite quite easily but i think you know in the context of working through the whole of a career those changes are they are the big challenges you know changing from steady times to drastic times mm -hmm. that's that's real issue changing from one company to another that's a big step changing from a commercial role to a ceo role that's that's a big challenge so change is probably the constant thing within all of that that creates the challenge and i think our ability to deal with change will vary from one person to the next and some people are much more comfortable with it than others and I'm pretty comfortable with it and I quite like it and I think it keeps us fresh. But I know other people are very different and 
they don't like it and they're less certain with it. But lots of change can be a challenge. But for some people, just one change can be a challenge. And you have to remember that. So I think that's probably, in my eyes, that's the answer to your question. And I hope I hope that's something you were looking to hear. And my final question is, I've got two, one, one might be a bit too deep, is what would you say to your 10-year-old version of you? Because it was just you and... You, was it just you and your mum? Did you have a sister? No, no. Um, Only child. Brother. Um, at, at 10 years old, um, life was pretty tough. You know, yeah. I was in a very poor family. I was in a, a, a broken... Um, my parents had separated when I was very young. Mm. And I think I was going through a little bit of a rebellious stage. And was probably doing things behind my mom's back I shouldn't have been doing and getting into all sorts of trouble and stuff like that but you know I, I could never really think beyond the next few days and weeks at that age because mm. you just you don't but I think I probably had quite a big chip on the shoulder because I, I didn't think that things were going my way mm. and I was in a, a school and I had some great mates and they're all in happy homes and everything was hunky-dory and I think for me and our family it wasn't always like that and we you know we're a typical northeast working class family and like like a lot of families and even some today who are struggling in difficult times with cost of living and so on you doubt whether things will get better and you think it might always be this way mm. and I was a young lad fighting battles on the Meadowell Estate in Tyneside, which was a tough place to grow up. And, you know, many people don't make it out of that estate. And I did. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunities I've had along the way to be able to do that. So my advice would be, um, no matter what, things can get better and can improve. And, and you can have out of life what you want provided you're prepared to put the time and effort in to make it work for you. Nothing ever just gets served up on a plate. You always have to, I think, be prepared to work for it and to make it happen and to seek the opportunities. And don't give up. You know, Don't give up. Keep pushing on. No matter how hard it gets, there is always sunshine after a storm. And that's the time when you start to begin to think, okay, yeah, actually this is great and things are getting better. You know, I started to study and did okay at school and stuff like that. And then you begin to think, ah, okay, yeah, this is, this is great and you know, I'm enjoying life. So, but I know it's it's not always like that, you know, and in, in this day and age where, you know, people are beginning to understand now the, the impact and the harm that, anxiety and stress can can make to people and how people really struggle with depression and and mental health issues it's tough i know it's tough and you know i've, I've seen people go through what that means but just individually i've always felt keep fighting keep going you'll get there you know the dream is not impossible you can if you keep pushing, if you don't give up, if you have that inner belief, if if you feel that you're going to be unstoppable, you probably can be. And sometimes fake it till you make it. You know, if you if you trick your mind into thinking that actually this is going to be okay, we'll get through this. And from that point on, I think you're on a you're on a good path. I mean, when you think about that 10-year-old version that you've described, I wonder if he ever believed he'd be the CEO and president of a luxury hotel group in another country. Uh, definitely not. He would never have dreamt it. <laughs> exactly. And But what it sounds to me that happened was that I believe that life reveals or the mind reveals the next chapter of what's potential. So it reveals our chapters of our potential. 
enough so that it doesn't scare us and enough that we keep um I was I was uh interviewing somebody yesterday um in a previous episode Simon Middleton who runs ultra marathons 100 mile marathons and there are seven mile checkpoints and I feel like and you just you just see the race in seven mile uh, seven mile chunks and I feel like our mind and life reveals the next chapter but it's not the whole picture it's just the picture it knows where it scare the life out of you and that will keep you moving in it and I think good for the 10 year old version of David um <laughs> David Taylor who could well have stayed in Tyneside on that estate and done all right got, got a day yeah. got a day job done all right but no I still know people there who it, I'm in touch with and it's it's cool you know, very happy people and doing great. Yeah. Um, but for you, you just kept fulfilling your potential and um, and you are unstoppable, David. And I think you're a huge inspiration um, to everybody. And so thank you so much for your time, your heart, your spirit, your laughter, and for being in my life. Well, that, that, that's importantly. really very kind of you to say, and you, you don't need to say that, but it is appreciated. And, you know, I, I value having spent so many years with you along the way. We've had a lot of laughs and we've achieved a lot. And whilst we don't see each other that much these days, it's always good to be in touch and to speak to you. And similarly, you know, I think the work that you're doing at the moment is is really important and people will gain a lot from it. And just the ability, I think, to to have some help and support to begin to understand what they can achieve in life can can really unleash huge potential. So you know, keep doing it and keep helping people achieve that. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>